place and open up your Bibles, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Hope you guys are excited to be here. Get in the scriptures here. You know, uh, this week was kind of a tragic week uh, in the news. A lot of things going on that uh, weren't such great, great things. Uh, in, in particular, a couple of people died this week that was very disappointing. Uh, Paul Walker, the actor from the Fast and the Furious movies, passed away in a car crash uh, and died uh, early in the week. And then uh, Nelson Mandela, the leader of South Africa, or well, the, the, the former president of South Africa, passed away as well uh, at the age of 95 uh, in, in the old age. And, uh, you know, really with the passing of these two guys, I, I think the world becomes a little bit of a darker place, a little bit sadder place, as both of them made some uh, great impacts on the world. And uh, you may look and go, well, Paul Walker and Nelson Mandela, they're, they're really different. One's an actor, it's all about money and fame, and well, that was true, but at the same time, getting to know him now from behind the scenes, he actually did a lot. Uh, he, he started a, uh, a nonprofit organization to help out when there were uh, disasters and stuff called Reach Out Worldwide. Uh, and so it was, whenever there was a natural disaster, he would go with some people and help pitch in and, and try to help clean up and put people's lives back together and, and uh, be a great servant that way. Of course, we know Nelson Mandela as the leader of South Africa, but uh, best known as you know, a man who was the first African-American, black African, uh, South African to become president of South Africa and uh, to really help unite that uh, country uh, and overcome some racial inequalities there. And I, and I think, honestly, that uh, we can learn some great lessons from both of these guys. And, uh, and I want to share a few things just in reading about them and studying and, and thinking about them a little more this week uh, that I learned and would like to pass on to you. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, the Bible starts and says this in verse 26. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. It says, To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner he gives the task as gathering up and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. You know, hopefully you're here this morning because you want to please God. I hope that's, that's why. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons to come to church, but the really only best reason is because I just want to please God and get to know God. You may come because you just cannot find a happier group of people to be with than this group of people. Well, and that may be true, but uh, in, while we're an awesome group of people, we're not the reason to be here. It says to the man who pleases God, the man or woman who pleases God, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. That really our, our attitude in life should be, I want to please God. I want to do things that make God happy and uh, to, to live for, for Him. You know, it's incredible that when we live a life to please God, He takes care of us so much. He says, to the man who pleases God, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering up to give it to the man who pleases God. That's incredible. Not only does God bless us in our lives when we live to please Him, but then He makes other people give us blessings as well. And that's incredible, is it not? How God truly takes care of us if we truly just seek to Him. But there's something here that's very important to note that we've really got to understand. He doesn't say to the group who pleases Him. He doesn't say to the church who pleases Him. He says to the man, to the woman, to the individual that pleases God. we got to understand that it's great to be a part of a church and it's very important and hopefully as a church we're trying to be pleasing to God. But what it comes down to is us as individuals. What effort am I making to please God? What effort am I making to make a difference for God? To live the life that God would be pleased of? See, the church can only be pleasing to God if, if as individuals we live a life that's pleasing to God. So today I've entitled my lesson to the one who pleases Him. You know, when we take a moment to consider Paul Walker and Nelson Mandela, both of them stood up for good things. Things that needed to be done around him. As I shared, Paul Walker founded the charity. Nelson Mandela stood up for equality in his country. And really changed the world in a lot of, of what he did. Uh, in fact, uh, it was uh, Paul Walker was killed returning from a fundraiser for his charity. That's when he was in a car wreck. Uh, and so, even in death, it was his last moments were to try to raise money to help people around the world. He was raising money to help for the typhoon victims over in the Philippines 
That was an incredible thing. Today I've entitled my lesson, The One Who Pleases God. I, I can't say for a fact that Nelson Mandela or Paul Walker were pleasing to God, though it looks by their actions, they, they could be. But there's some things we can learn that, that we need to be, that they were, that indeed were pleasing to God. So I want to look at three things, three areas where we can decide to be pleasing to God in our lives. Amen? Amen. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 39. Jeremiah chapter 39. My first point, the one who pleases God is the one who trusts in God. The one who pleases God is the one who trusts in God. In Jeremiah chapter 39, we read this, starting in verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 15. It says, While Jeremiah had been confined in the courtyard of the guard, courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him. Go and tell Ebed Melech the Cushite. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. I am about to fulfill my words against this city, though through disaster, not prosperity. At that time they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be handed over to those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life, because you trust in me, declares the Lord. You know, in the time when Jeremiah was prophesying at this time and speaking, Israel basically was a stubborn, rebellious nation. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, he says, you are stubborn, hearted people. You're rebellious, and now I'm going to destroy you. His preaching in the time, basically in chapter 39, he's preaching about the fall of Jerusalem. He's saying, hey, the king of Babylon is coming, and he is going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to destroy the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. They're going to be, exist no longer. In fact, we'll read in a second in chapter 38, he's telling the people, okay, we're under siege from the Babylonians, give up. If you stay in the city and fight, you're going to die. So you need to give up and go quit and just be led off into captivity and then you'll live. Nobody really liked that message. So in the midst of preaching this doom and gloom message, Jeremiah actually reaches out to one individual. God says, hey, go tell this guy. See, everybody else around him was being unfaithful. But Ebed-Melech, for some reason, God says, hey, you are going to live. And then he gives the reason. Because you trust in me. That's incredible. When nobody else was trusting in God, this one guy was standing up to put his faith in God. Trusting him. Surrendering his life to him. Turn back to chapter 38 and we'll see how he puts his trust in God. What's that mean? Putting his trust in God. In chapter 38, we read this starting in verse 1. It says, Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pashur, Jehuchal, son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, son of Malchijai, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, This is what the Lord says, Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says, This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who will capture it. Then the officials said to the king, This man should be put to death. He's discouraging the soldiers who are left in the city as well as all the people by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. He had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But ebed Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. While the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, ebed Melech went out to the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebek Melech, the Cushite, Take thirty men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. 
So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with the ropes to Jeremiah and the cistern. Ebed-Melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guards. So how did Ebed-Melech show himself to trust in gods? Well, he stood up to the rest of the king's officials, to the evil leaders around him. He stood up by himself to do the good things to Jeremiah the prophet, who was speaking on behalf of God. He stood up in a time when nobody else was standing up. He showed himself to be a man trusting in God. He heard Jeremiah's prophecies... And yet he understood that what Jeremiah was saying was from God and needed to be listened to. All the other leaders said, we need to kill Jeremiah. He's getting everybody to turn against us. And yet what Jeremiah was speaking was the words of God. See, we've got to understand to trust God means we've got to listen to obey the words of God. We've got to trust that what he teaches from the scriptures. When we read the Bible, that what it says does matter. What it says is important, and we need to put those into practice. Amen? Amen. We've got to decide, I'm going to live by the Scriptures and not by my emotions or feelings. Really, if we break down, and I want you to think about this, who ebed Melech is. It says in verse 7 that he was a Cushite. So, who was Cushites? Well, he wasn't an Israelite. He was maybe taken as a captive sometime or converted to Judaism sometime in his life and then came to Jerusalem probably a fairly wise guy or a smart individual and because he raised up to become one of, it says, uh, in, he, was, uh, he was an official in the royal palace. So he was, you know, somewhat of importance. And yet he stood in direct opposition to all the other people who were the true Israelites. You know, it's never easy when you're an outsider to stand up to those who are on the inside, is it? You know, we know that uh, both Paul Walker and Nelson Mandela, that's part of their life, standing up for on the outside from the norm. Paul Walker could have used his fame and his celebrity, his wealth to please himself, to take care of his friends, to, to make, you know, give them money, to, to win more friends. But instead, he used his money to quietly serve and to help. We know that Nelson Mandela, on time when, though he was part of the majority, was the minority voice, spoke up. It was his activism, it was his willingness to stand up when things were wrong that cost him part of his life. For 27 years, he was in prison because of his activism and his, his, his saying, hey, apartheid is wrong. See, the way South Africa is, is built is about 90% of the population are black and 10% is white, even some, maybe even greater in some areas. But in South Africa during apartheid, the whites had the rule of the country. They were in charge. And in fact, they had all the wealth and all the money and all the powers. You couldn't be in power if you were black. Nelson Mandela and the other black African, uh, South Africans said this was wrong. And so they spoke against that and tried to stand up and try to change it. And because of that, he was put in prison. He was a lawyer. He was a very learned person, a very smart person, had been educated around in, in England and other places. And yet... Because he stood up in a time when he was the minority, though he was the majority, he was put in prison. He, 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 he was willing to take the cost. ebed Melech was the same kind of guy. To stand up in a time when his voice, trusting in God, was not the norm, not the standard. And God is the one who says, you trust in me. You're pleasing to me. So I'm going to spare your life. I'm going to destroy everybody else that stays in Jerusalem. But you're going to walk away and you're going to have your life. What an incredible promise from God. You know, it's easy to say we trust in God. But it's our actions that really show whether we truly trust in God. We've got to have the courage to stand up and to to face difficult times. But to say, hey, this is what the scriptures say. I'm going to trust in God. Something I began talking about last week and I'm going to continue to talk about as is, is recently was the passing of SB1 here in Hawaii, the, the allowing of gay marriage in Hawaii. We've got to decide that, hey, we can't hate people who are homosexual in their tendencies. That, some people are that way and I understand that. But we've got to understand the Bible says that's a sin. 
it's wrong. And we cannot support that. You know, this week I got a chance to go to a meeting with a whole bunch of different pastors from different churches just talking about, all right, we, we've got to address this issue because we're becoming a state that is so godless. And we don't want to be a part of a state that's godless, do we? We want to be a, a, a part of a state that, that trusts in God, that, that turns to God and says, look, we may not understand completely or even agree completely, but the words of God says this. God says this, so I'm going to trust what God says is the right way. And I'm going to stand up for that. You know, as part of our meeting, we were looking at the fact that of all of the uh, testimony for this SB1, 80% of the testimony was against SB1 passing. 80%. And yet the, the senators and the representatives still passed the law. And we were asking why, if there's so much testimony. And they said, well, you've got to remember this. That the senators and, the, and the, the people that are in office, they do not serve the people. We may think they're supposed to serve the people, but really they don't. Who they serve are the voters. Those people willing to vote. And in Hawaii, we have some of the lowest voter turnout in all the nation. Out of the million people in the Hawaii that can vote, only about 400,000 turn out to vote. About 300,000 right from the start aren't even registered to vote. So we got to change that. We got to help people register to vote. So of the, of the, again, of the 700,000, about half of them, about 300,000, don't even vote. So only about 400,000 people vote when it comes time to vote. And the people who are voted, those people in Hawaii, are very liberal in their voting. And so when the Senate looks and says, even though 80%, I don't, they don't fear the Christians. They don't fear the vote of the Christians because the Christians are the worst group as far as voter turnout. We have the lowest voter turnout in all of the states. So Christian morals, Christian values, the Bible is not stood up for because we don't stand up for it. To show true trust in God says, I want to live by the Bible and I want to help other people live by the Bible. This is the best way to have life. We as a church need to make sure we repent. This year, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to make sure that everyone here registers to vote. Amen? Amen. And that we talk about, hey, these are the issues that are facing us. We have to stand up for righteousness. We've got to trust God and His plan, His way of thinking. His way of doing things. Just like Ebed Melech. It, he wasn't a popular guy. He took his life in his hands. The king says, hey, take 30 guys with you. Why? Why didn't they take 30 guys? Because there might be a fight. And Ebed Melech might need a little bit of an army with him once he goes to get Jeremiah out of the cistern. He goes and he says, oh, he gets some clothes. He says, put these under your arms. And it takes all 30 of them to hoist Jeremiah because he'd sunk it in the mud in the cistern and yanked him out so that he could at least be somewhat safe. We've got to decide to stand up. You know, it was, it was interesting to note at that meeting that of all of the districts in Hawaii, uh, there were only like four people who stood up and said no to SB1. One of them is the representative for Hilo. He looked at, he was the one person in all the Big Island, of all the Big Island representatives to vote no on SB1. The guy speaking at the, the meeting said, hey, we've got to support him. His name is Cliff Suji, right? Yeah. Cliff Suji. We've got to support him because now he's got a big target on his back. Because he stood up and where most people are very liberal, he said, no, this is wrong. I'm going to obey the Bible. He's got the moral values to represent Christians, which is awesome. You know, I don't know all of him, but the one thing I do know, like, he stood up to say no. And now he's got a target on his back. When they look around, when the liberals look around and say, who do we need to replace? He's one of the guys they need to replace because he's not voting their way. We've got to decide, hey, all those liberals, they need to have a target on their back. Right. One, we've got to target them out of love to say, we're not going to stand up for unrighteousness. We're going to stand up for righteousness. We're going to trust God and do the things that God wants us to do. And God will work on our behalf. God will move. God will help us to live. When those people die, when their campaigns. Now, physically, I'm not saying we need to kill them or anything like that. Don't get me wrong there. 
But the fact is that we've got to, we've got to let their Senate seats die. We've got to let their representative, representation of us die. And we've got to put people in who are willing to trust God, who have the same moral values that we do. Amen? Amen. The question we need to ask ourselves, do we trust God? Well, we show that by our actions. We show it by willingness to stand up for what is right, for standing up for the scriptures and saying, well, this is what the Bible says. I love everybody around us. God says he wants everyone to be saved. God says he doesn't, he's not excited when someone dies. He doesn't want people to die. He wants people to have a relationship with him. Those who trust God will be helping others to have a relationship with him. Amen? Amen. Turn over to Joshua chapter 24. Okay. Joshua chapter 24. The person who is pleasing to God, my second point, will be the one who has courage. The person who is pleasing to God will be the one who has courage. It definitely will be the one who trusts God. And that trust God also means you have to have courage to stand out and do what God wants you to do. In jo Joshua chapter 24, Joshua chapter 24, we read this starting in verse 14. The Israelites have come into the promised land. Joshua has led them. And if you remember the start of the book of Joshua, if you've read it, the Bible says that God told Joshua, be strong and be courageous. I am with you. So be strong and courageous. Joshua leads the Israelites. They come into the land. They conquer the people around them. They take the promised land. And now we're at the end of Joshua's life. And we read this starting in verse 14. Joshua is speaking to the Israelites for the last time. He tells them, now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God Himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us in our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. You know, what an incredible chapter here. We read, Joshua stands up, he makes his choice. See, it was going to take courage for him to continue to serve God. He's telling everybody, you know, when you give everybody a choice, there's a little bit of that fear that they might choose the other thing, right? You know, sometimes I, you know, I say, okay, Angie, do you want fish or do you want steak for dinner? Steak. <laughs> well, there's that chance that Angie might go, I feel like fish tonight. I go, oh, okay, that's cool. We'll have fish tonight then. You know, my heart really wants steak. There's a little bit of courage I have to have to have fish in case she wants fish. No, just joking. That's not true courage. But when we give someone a choice, it does take courage to accept the fact that they might choose otherwise, right? Joshua is saying, hey, choose for yourself. Do you want to serve God or the gods of Egypt? Do you want to serve God or the gods of the Amorites? Who do you wish to serve? As for me and my household, I don't care who you choose. I'm serving God. My household, we are going to serve God. I don't care what anybody else says. All the other people go, we're going to serve God too. We're going to be with you, Joshua. We're going to serve God. And he's like, hey man, this is awesome. And they have a great time and, and talk. And he reminds them, hey... Serving God's not easy. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard for you because you are stubborn and you're rebellious and you have a tendency to be this way and that way. But are you sure? Yes. Awesome. Then serve God. You know, skip down to verse 31. It says, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. What was the impact of Joshua's courage? Israel stayed faithful for the rest of his life. He was an old man by the time they went into the promised land. Most likely in his 60s or 70s when they went into the promised land. So maybe he lived for another 30, 40, 50 years as their leader. He helped them to remain faithful during that whole time. 
which was awesome. His courage inspired a nation to stay faithful. You know, I was thinking about Nelson Mandela, and I read this quote this week. He says, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not, the, not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. You know, I think he showed such great courage. I think that's why he's such an inspirational uh, person to us. A person that we can look to and get inspired by. Because he showed such great courage in the face of his life. Could you imagine being in prison for 27 years? Unjustly. And yet coming out of prison not bitter, not angry, forgiving, and just wanting to see peace between his people. The, the, the key of his presidency was not that the blacks took control of South Africa, but that truly he began to change to make the country a unified country between the blacks and the whites. One of his first things, maybe you've seen the movie Invictus, was to support the South African rugby team. Historically, the South African rugby team had been an all-white team. It was an all-white sport. The, the black Africans didn't support rugby. And yet he did. He said, we need to support. This is South Africa. We need to support this team. And they ended up winning the world championship that year, which was amazing. But it was such an, an incredible victory for him as well as the country. See, he had the courage to face his fears. See, while he was in prison, his wife divorced him and left him. Friends abandoned him. Other people left him. While he was in prison, he was beaten. While he was in prison, he was harshly treated. While he was in prison, many of the world leaders in our day condemned him as a terrorist. Many of the U.S. leaders at the time when he was in prison didn't speak up and say, Oh, Nelson Mandela's awesome. He's a terrorist and he deserves to be in prison. See, Nelson Mandela, before he went into prison, had, was lobbying and was a lawyer, was fighting for uh, equality, and yet what was happening is that the white government began to kill a lot of the, South, the black South Africans who were fighting. He came to the realization, we can't fight a peaceful fight. We have to arm ourselves. So he actually was trained in some terrorist camps to fight. And yet he made a distinction. He says, we're going to fight, but we're not going to kill anybody. He fought, and this is why he was put in prison, what they would do is they would go to government uh, facilities and they would blow them up. But they would blow them up at times when nobody was there. His, his desire was to show we're going to be violent, we're going to be active, but we're not going to kill anybody. Because he just didn't want to go that far. So when he was put in prison, most of the world's leaders condemned him. And said, yes, he deserves it. And yet through time, the world leadership began to change and realize, no. Apartheid is wrong. For some of you that are young, you may not know what apartheid was. I remember when I was in college, our college campus was, you know, I went to a fairly liberal school. There was a lot of protesting. I remember my whole sophomore year in college, they had a whole bunch of people set up the shanty town. The towns where the black Africans lived were called shanty towns. And basically they were cardboard or plywood houses while all the whites lived in very nice, rich houses in South Africa. And so on my campus, a whole bunch of students set up sh a shanty town. So they were living in these small, rather than living in the dorms, they were living in these little cardboard houses and stuff like that. And in Portland, where we lived, it is cold and rainy in the wintertime. And yet they lived there. They were protesting because our college, like all colleges that have investments and try to make money, some of our investments were in companies who were invested in South Africa. So the protests were divest from South Africa. And every day they met outside the president's office. Divest, divest, and they chanted and stuff like that. I went to a couple of the meetings, but I thought, live in a cardboard box? No, no thank you, that's not for me. I wasn't that liberal at that time, you know? But one of the things I appreciated when I look back now was the courage of people to stand up for something they truly believed in. You know, to, to speak out and to face their fears. To face and, and overcome, you know? To, to, to sacrifice what may be comfortable for them. For us, we've got to decide to be courageous. Those who are going to be pleasing to God are those who take courage, who have courage in the face of their fears, who stand up and, and fight against their fears. Nelson Mandela was one of those guys. Could you imagine coming out of prison after 27 years? The choice he had to make was to forgive. 
What a hard choice that must have been. After 27 years of, of rude and, and rough treatment, to come out and not be bitter at people, to forgive his wife who divorced him, to forgive his friends who had left him, to forgive even the worldwide leaders who had condemned him, but to accept them and just want to see peace. That took an incredible amount of courage. And because of that, he led his nation to truly change, to become the first black African, uh, South African president of his nation. And really to make the world a better place. Amen? Amen? And finally, to be one that God, uh, that, that pleases God is to be one who stands in the gap. My third point, we've got to be one who stands in the gap. Ezekiel chapter 22. To be one who's pleasing to God is to one who trusts in God. To surrender our life to God. To be one who's pleasing to God is to be one who shows great courage. To stand in courage for God. And to be pleasing to God is to be one who stands in the gap. Ezekiel chapter 22, we read this starting in verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. The Bible says this, God speaking, it says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. So I'll pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. What a sad testament of affairs. That God looks around and says, I'm looking for one. Just one person to stand up in the gap and save the land. And I can't find anybody. So I'm going to have to destroy these people. It reminds me of the time that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham was the man who stood up in the gap and says, God, would you destroy the whole city if there are 50 righteous people? And God says, okay, no, if there's 50 righteous people, I won't destroy it. He says, God, how about just 40 people? And he negotiates 30 and 20 and 10. God, how about just 5 people, 10 people? God says, all right, I'll, I'll spare it. We know that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But what did he spare? He spared the one or two or three or four righteous people who were living in that city. Lot and his family. He let them come out because one man stood in the gap and that was Abraham. Willing to try to negotiate with God. To stand up and say, God, please. I think for us, we've got to decide to stand up and stand in the gap in prayer for one another. You know, I think sometimes we may not be doing well spiritually. But it's the prayer of those people around us. They're standing in the gap and saying, God, I know Ben Kohler is not doing so awesome right now. God, I know he just did this and he just did that. And I know Lamont is mad at him because he did this and he did that, God. But please forgive him anyways. I know he's a knucklehead, but Father, even knuckleheads deserve forgiveness. And God says, Amen, okay. I won't destroy Ben right now. We should be grateful. But it should speak to so much more how much we should be praying for one another. How much are you standing in the gap for each other? You know, I'm so excited that Tana's going to be getting baptized today. It's exciting when, when someone comes to add, be added to God's kingdom, when someone gets salvation. But Tana didn't grow up, he'll tell you, he didn't grow up worshiping God. He didn't grow up really knowing God or even Jesus. Coming to church and reading his Bible and praying, that's foreign to him, right? I mean, he's like, go to church? What? What is church, you know? And yet he had some guys in his life sitting right up here in the front row with him who were willing to stand in the gap and say something to him. Willing to speak out to him and say, hey, and try to show him the way. Because of that, he's going to be our brother very soon, and that's exciting. There's so many more people around us that need us to stand in the gap for them. They just don't know yet. They don't have the chance to have salvation yet. And yet, we've got to stand up for them. You know, sometimes in sports, you can hear about someone, oh man, he put the team on his shoulders and carried them to victory. The guy basically stood in the gap, or the girl stood in the gap and carried the team to, to a great victory because they did above and beyond what they normally do. We've got to be those people who stand in the gap. In James chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
says, hey, you sick? Are you in sin? Then confess to one another and then pray for one another so you can be healed. See, our prayers for one another are powerful and effective in helping one another. You know, Paul Walker was a guy who stood in the gap. Uh, back in 2011, when a tornado hit Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Paul Walker went there to help. He hadn't founded his organization yet, but he just was moved by the devastation and he went to help. The director of Reach Out Worldwide said he didn't want anyone to know he was there. All he wanted was a chainsaw and for someone to point him in the right direction. And then he went to work. Said J.D. Dorfman from Reach Out Worldwide Operations Manager, Paul's fingers were as dirty as everybody else's. See, what a great example. He took time from his celebrity just to sneak off, to hide on, put a hat, a helmet on and stuff like that, to just go do some work, to try to help people's lives, to stand in the gap, to repair someone's lives, to put them back in order. It started in 2006, when he went to, uh, or 2009, when he went to uh, Chile. There was a big earthquake in Chile. And many of us might remember because our church was very involved in helping a lot of people. That's when Matt and Helen Sullivan were down there. Paul Walker went there to help, and he realized, I I'm limited in my abilities. I, I can go and help a little bit and repair things and do construction and that kind of stuff, but these people need a lot more skilled people. So his charity raises money to, to hire first responders, to pay first responders, so that doctors and nurses and people who have the practical skills to re rebuild can be sent and you know, not suffer too much in missing out on their lives the cost to get some of those people there, to get the medical supplies there and stuff like that. So ever since that time in Chile, that's what he's been doing. He was raising money to send money to, uh, you know, to uh, the Philippines. He had gone to Haiti when there was a big earthquake there. In Haiti, he was just like anybody else. It says he was going around to the army and the different people hustling for supplies and you know, formula and things like that, just trying to get it to people doing what he could, but he realized that his skills were very limited. See, it was these experiences that he said, look, I want to stand in the gap. I want to use what I can do to make a difference in other people's lives. See, sometimes we feel like, well, I don't have this skill, or I don't have that skill, I'm not this person, I'm not that person, so I, I can't do anything. Paul Walker understood his limitations, but he also understood what he could do. And what he could do was use his fame and celebrity to raise money. The company that he worked for and made the movies with have decided that all of the proceeds to the Fast and Furious 6 movie are going to go to his Reach Out Worldwide organization in honor of him. You know, it's maybe not a whole bunch. It's maybe not going to be billions and billions of dollars. And in the end, it, it's not going to stop the things from happening. But he is a man that stood in the gap. And his life is meaning something to those people whose lives he's helping. There was a story that I read online that, I, that really touched me. One day before he had even started his Reach Out Worldwide, he had just started and he just made his first movie. He was at a jewelry store and he was getting some jewelry and he, he was there and he heard uh, a, 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 a soldier was there with his fiance. And they were looking at rings and he was like, honey, I would really like to buy this ring for me, but I can't afford it right now. And so they began to walk away and Paul Walker walked over and says, I'll buy it. You get whatever you want and I'll buy it for you. And he bought this simple soldier and then he paid for the ring and he walked away. He left, you know. He didn't need the congratulations. He didn't need anything. The store manager went up to the couple and said, hey, whatever you want. Whatever you want to get, you get it. It's been taken care of for you already. He didn't even stick around for the couple to thank him. That's what it means to stand in the gap. To not necessarily, again, have all the skills in the world, but to have the skill and then to use it. To have a talent and to use it. You know, we've got to decide to be people like Paul Walker. To remember to stand in the gap. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 6. Sometimes we can see our limitations, but we still need to stand up. And Isaiah 6 is a great reminder of this. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. And Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. We read this about Isaiah himself. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds took, shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah understood. When he came in the presence of God, he understood, Whoa, I am a man of unclean lips. I am filled with sin. He understood that how could he possibly represent God? How could he possibly speak up on his own? He couldn't. Because he was unclean himself and all the people around him were unclean. And yet he understood as soon as the, the seraph came to him, takes the hot coal and puts it on his mouth and says, Now you're clean. Now your sins have been atoned for. You're no longer guilty. He understood at that moment, God was saying, Stand up. Stand in the gap for my people. As soon as God said that, he said, I am going to go. God said, Who am I going to send? Who's going to speak up to my people? Isaiah said, here am I. Could you imagine that? As soon as he got done being converted, he said, here am I. Send me. Did he have to go through the first principles class first? No. Did he have to be trained and, and do the deep convictions workbook first? No. You know, did he have to have a certain number of follow-up studies and, and, well, I really don't know what I'm doing, so I'm going to let Nathan do all the work and I'm just going to tag along behind him. Nope. As soon as he understood forgiveness, he said, here am I, send me. For each of us that have been forgiven of our sins, we've got to have the heart of Isaiah. To know you're a person standing in the gap is to be a person who's willing to say, here am I, send me. As soon as Tana comes out of that water, the expectation is he goes, Here am I, send me. Who am I going to find? Who am I going to help? When he comes out of the water, hopefully he'll be very grateful for the forgiveness of his sins. So from Tana to the one who's been around the longest in the church, it doesn't matter who you are. To stand in the gap means to be grateful for the forgiveness we've been given. To be grateful. Not because everybody around us is going to respond. In fact, if you read on, starting in verse 9 and stuff, he says, I'm sending you to a rebellious people who are going to always be hearing, but not listening to you. They're going to be seeing, but not really knowing. I'm going to send you to people who will not listen to your voice. But go anyway, because I'm sending you. See, we can't go only to the people who are going to be grateful, because we don't know who's going to be grateful and who's not. The day that Loa met Tana, he didn't know that Tana was going to be grateful. He just knew, God is sending me, and i got to go. And look, here's a guy standing here looking lost. Let me help him find fouls. Amen? And that's so awesome. That's so awesome, but that's how we have to be. That's where our hearts need to be. Our hearts need to be the hearts to say, Hey, God, I may not know what I'm doing, but I'm willing to go. I'm willing to stand in the gap for people. There's some of your family. Some of your friends, some of your neighbors, some of your co-workers, some of the strangers walking by you in the mall that you need to stand in the gap for. That you need to be willing to reach out and share your faith with them. To help them understand who God is. To get the forgiveness that God wants to give them. It's not just preaching for others, but it's praying for others as well. We've got to have the heart to stand in the gap for those who are saved and for those that are lost. To be willing to say, hey... There are times when it may seem like nobody else is listening. Nobody else is trying to do good. Do you get an attitude of people because of that? Do you get mad at other people because of their lack of righteousness? Or do you say, i got to pray for my brothers and sisters. i got to pray. Because now is the time for me to stand in the gap. I'm the person who's going to matter today. I appreciate when I see people walking by my house or brothers and sisters praying. Because I'm hoping maybe they're praying for me. That'd be awesome to know that you're praying for me. 
that you're standing in the gap for me. Because in the days that I fall down, I need somebody standing up there helping me out and helping me back up. The days where I'm tempted, I know I need somebody else praying. See, we all have the power to move God in our prayers. That's the amazing thing about the Bible. That it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what skills you have, doesn't matter what talents you are, you have the chance to make a difference to stand in the gap. Nelson Mandela once said, there's no passion to be found in playing small, in settling for a life that is less than the one you're capable of living. There's no passion to be found in playing small, in settling for a life that is less than the one you're capable of living. You are capable of living a life that's pleasing to God. You're capable of living a life that's trusting God. That where you trust Him, you trust His scriptures, you trust His word every single day. You're capable of living a life that's courageous, that's bold, and that stands out and makes it different in other people's lives. You're capable of making a difference in so many different people's lives. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. You have the opportunity to make a difference with your life. Don't settle for living small. Don't settle for living a life that's less capable of what you're able to do. Live a life capable of living a life that's pleasing to God. The question for you today that I have is, will you? Will you live a life that pleases our God? Thank you and God bless.